Continuing the notes with sections 3.1 and 3.2, we're now going to focus on the three ways to prove triangles congruent. You do have to memorize these, and you'll be using them quite frequently in this class. The first method is side, side, side. But instead of writing side, side, side in your proofs, you can just write SSS. What this says is, if we have two triangles, and if all three pairs of corresponding sides are congruent, if they have three distinct pairs of corresponding sides congruent, then that means that the triangles must be congruent. A second way to go about this is we can use side angle side. Once again, you do not have to write out side angle side, but instead you can use the abbreviation SAS to represent side angle side. Now, keep in mind, while drawing this one out, we have some restrictions that we want to be aware of. So if we have one pair of congruent sides, we have another pair of congruent sides. Please keep in mind, if you notice here, the angle is located in between the two sides, which means that the congruent angles in the triangles must be the angles included by the pairs of congruent sides. They would have to be located there in order for side angle side to work. You should be able to trace it in your triangle, side angle side side, angle, side. That means the two triangles are congruent, if that is true. And last but not least, we have angle, side, angle. But once again, instead of writing that out, you can just use the abbreviation ASA. Similarly to side, angle, side, we have some restrictions on this one. We want to make sure that we're very careful about the placement of our side here. So let's say we have one pair of congruent angles within the triangles. And let's say we have another pair of congruent angles within the triangles. Just like side, angle, side, the congruent sides must be the ones included by the pairs of congruent angles. So it would have to be in between those pairs of congruent angles. Once again, you should be able to trace it on your triangles and come across angle, then side, then angle. Angle, side, angle. If that's true, then the two triangles are congruent. Now, the reflexive property we'll see a lot in this class. And what it says is that any side or angle is congruent to itself. We'll see an example below. First thing I'd like you to do in example one is you have to read your givens and label your diagram. You will not receive credit if you do not label your diagrams. So make sure you're labeling the diagrams, including the given information. So I'm putting tick marks there. And then we're stuck at that point. But that's okay. Let's just see what we're working with so far. Um, we don't have any other information to work with. We do want to prove these two triangles congruent, LSH and LPH. And I'd be thinking right away, those two segments are sides, LS and LP of the triangles. And then same with segment SH and HP. Those are sides of the triangles as well. So after we write in our given information, we should be thinking, okay, in order to reach congruent triangles, we need congruent sides and angles. So we can say, since LS and LP are the same length, they must be congruent. And the reason for that is, if two segments have the same length, then they are congruent. That gives us a pair of congruent sides within the triangles. So we have an S as of right now. Let's see what else we have. So they gave us that SH, that segment SH is congruent to HP. That already gives us another pair of congruent sides. So let's think back. The three ways to prove triangles congruent are side, 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 angle, side, and angle, side, angle. At this point, since we already have two pairs of congruent sides, chances are we're not going to use angle, side, angle. Um, now we have to see if we can find a pair of congruent angles. I, we would have to say that angles S and P are congruent, and we can't assume that. But those two triangles share that side LH. It's completely included in both triangles. So we can use the reflexive property, which is the brand new property that we talked about above, to say that LH is congruent to itself. 
considering it is a side in both triangles. That gives us our third pair of congruent sides within the triangles. So at this point, we can say that our two triangles, LSH and LPH, are congruent by side side side. But now let's list out the steps in which we listed congruent sides. We listed a pair of congruent sides in step three, in step four, and in step five. You have to list that in your proof as well. Now we are done. Once again, in example two, we're moving on and we're filling in the givens and we're marking our tick marks. Right away I'd be thinking, N is the midpoint of M, okay, so that means we have two congruent segments. We know that angle MNP, okay, that's that large angle right here, is congruent to angle ONQ, which is that large angle right there, and QN is congruent to NP. So we're thinking of the three ways to prove triangles congruent, side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, where QN and NP are sides. Um, and being the midpoint gives us another pair of congruent sides, and we have some angles there. So let's prove these triangles congruent by using side angle side, since the angle is included between the two sides. So after we write down our first given, let's write what we get from it. So from N being the midpoint, we get that MN is congruent to NO, those two segments, because if a point is a midpoint, it divides the segment into two congruent segments, and that gives us a pair of congruent sides within the triangles. Now let's go ahead and write down our angles that we're given. But notice those angles are too big for the triangle, okay? So we have that overlapping piece that lies outside of the triangle. If we remove that piece and subtract it off, we'll be left with the smaller angles inside of the triangles. That's what we want, those smaller angles that are inside the triangles that are included between the congruent sides we have. So we have to use the subtraction property to say that those two smaller angles are congruent. And that gives us a pair of congruent angles within the triangles. And last but not least, the pair of congruent sides, QN and NP, that are given to us, that's just another pair of congruent sides we have. So we can go ahead and fill that in, and that's a pair of congruent sides. So we have the two triangles congruent at this point by side angle side with the angle being included between the two sides, so we're in good shape. So we can write out the triangle MNQ is congruent to triangle ONP by side angle side. But let's list out the steps in which we mentioned it. We mentioned our first pair of congruent sides in step two. We mentioned our pair of congruent angles in step four and our second pair of congruent sides in step five. For the final example three, Please go ahead and fill in the tick marks on the diagram. Remember, you have to mark your diagram to receive credit. So since CD is perpendicular to AB, right away we should be thinking about right angles that form there. And next, we're told that CD bisects angle ACB. Now be careful, angle ACB is at the top there, so that large angle is being bisected. So we get two smaller angles as a result. Right away I'd be thinking, okay, we have two angles here. So with our three ways to prove triangles congruent, side, 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 angle, side, or angle, side, angle, right here it looks like we're going to be using angle, side, angle. Since those two triangles completely include, they both have CD as an included side, so they share that side. So let's go ahead and write down our first given. And next, we know that from that given, the perpendicular segments, we get two right angles. We have to mention that the angles are right angles first. So those angles at the bottom of the triangle, CDA and CDB, are right angles. Why? Because if two segments are perpendicular, then they form a right angle. Now, that's not enough for an A in the diagram because we have to mention congruent angles. So next, after we say the angles are right, we have to say that those right angles are congruent to each other in order for us to get a pair of congruent angles. So those two angles are congruent because if two angles are right angles, then they are congruent. And that gives us a pair of congruent angles within the triangles. Next, we have that shared side CD. So we can use the reflexive property, which we learned today, to say that CD, that segment is congruent to itself by the reflexive property, to give us a pair of congruent sides within the triangles. So that's our S. And last but not least, we have to get to our last A. 
While we mentioned our first given of perpendicularity, we still have to write down the fact that CD bisects angle ACD. And let's say what we get from that. So from that, we can see that that top angle is bisected, which gives us two smaller angles, ACD and BCD congruent, because if a ray bisects an angle, then it divides the angle into two congruent angles. And that gives us our last pair of congruent angles within the triangle. And since our side is included in between the angles, we can say that those two triangles are congruent by angle side angle. And we mentioned our first pair of congruent angles in step three. We mentioned our pair of congruent sides by the reflexive property in step four and our second pair of congruent angles in step six.